Welcome to Enter the Mind Podcast, the most real talk, no-nonsense podcast on the empowering of the mind. Today we are interviewing Emily Nader, a health, a fitness, and wellness coach. So Emily, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, we're excited to have you. So why don't you kick us off, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into health, fitness, and wellness. Sure. Um, so I've always been pretty curious about the human body, how it works. I've always believed it to be like this incredible thing. Like when we get a cut, it knows how to heal itself. And same thing goes for like injuries. So I studied it in college. And the more I just kind of went through life and the experiences that I've had, I just kept learning more and more about how amazing it really is. And really what kind of kick-started me into it was getting diagnosed with depression when I was in college and kind of utilizing movement as my main tool for dealing with the, I guess, symptoms of depression and kind of allowing myself to really explore like my body's potential and seeing how strong my mind could get through movement. Um, and that really propelled me forward into this new direction. And then I started paying attention to more nutrition because I realized that was a huge part of having my body adapt the way I wanted it to physically and mentally and emotionally, because when we eat a certain way, we allow ourselves to kind of be more sensitive to what we're feeling and not so numb um, to this point where we just don't know what's going on. So it's opened up like this connection for myself uh, to my body in a way that I never imagined, but it's, it's really awesome. What are some of the changes in your nutrition that gave you really, really positive results that maybe you weren't expecting, but that's what happened? Yeah, I never really, I feel like most people, I, I can't speak for everybody, I'll just speak from I, but essentially I didn't really change my diet until there was a medical reason. And I feel like a lot of times we we feel like we don't need to make a change unless there's an actual like sense of urgency to do so. So I got diagnosed with a hormone disorder and my doctor told me that I needed to be gluten free. Otherwise, I was going to lead down the track of pre-diabetes, obesity, excessive weight gain, not and just all these other symptoms and, and problems that I'd be dealing with if I didn't cut out gluten and dairy and refined sugar. And at first that sounded like a lot to me. I was just like, what am I gonna eat? That's literally everything that I eat, like pizza, beer, hamburgers. Like what am I gonna eat? But uh, I really took it one step at a time. So I started with the gluten and I noticed that was like one of the main things that really changed the game for me and being able to manage my weight a lot better. And also being able to see the changes that I wanted to see from the way that I was training in the gym. It also allowed me to realize that I could focus better on my work. I wasn't getting like brain fog or sleepiness after eating because I cut out the pastas, I cut out the breads, all of those like bready carbs and those grains. I didn't really cut out grains at that point, but those were really clouding my mind, I realized. So that was one of the big differences that I saw was cutting out gluten. And it wasn't necessarily eating like packaged foods that were labeled gluten free, but it was me eating more like natural foods, like food from the earth, like meats, fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, like things that were given to us from the earth, not like man-made food in, in like a, in a manufacturing, but there's other complications that can come along with switching so quickly from a diet like that, um, that are like good to consider, especially when you're making changes. But I'd say that was the number one thing for me was going gluten-free. 
Now, I love that um, because I totally agree. I swear to you, I feel like gluten is the devil. Um, It's genuinely like the brain fog, the bloating. It's just like, it's not worth it. You know, like what you and I were talking about at the conference, you know, it's not worth it uh, (laughs) to just be eating that. But my question for you is, can you explain to us a little bit about what the brain fog is? Like when you say you get brain fog from certain foods, does that show up as, um, like you said, like not being able to concentrate, but does it show up as like, uh, like negative thoughts and what kinds of negative thoughts does it show up as inaction? What does it show up as this brain fog for you? Yeah. I love that because it helps me kind of connect from point A to point B to point C, like what happens when I eat, when I get that brain fog. And it's everything that you're saying, like difficulty concentrating. And then that turns into me almost like getting negative thoughts because I can't be productive or I'm not like doing the things that I need to do. It's like, I'm getting distracted. And then it kind of goes into a spiral of why can't you get anything done? Or like, can't you just sit and focus? And it almost feels like there's like this resistance that comes up um, that's making it harder for me to go about the rest of my day. And then it's like a lot of the thoughts that will come up are like, well, maybe you should just take a nap. And it's like, I wouldn't have normally wanted to take a nap. Like I never usually want to do that unless I like hardly got any sleep the night before, but otherwise I'm usually good to go for the day. So then I know I can like pinpoint, it's like, well, what was different about what I ate than usual? And it's like that. So then I can be like, I'm pretty sure that's what it was that caused me to get tired, difficulty concentrating, can't focus. Um, I don't know. I think I did say tired already. Um, And then, yeah, that kind of breeds into the negative thought patterns because I'm not able to get anything done. And it's a little funky. I feel like everyone has their own thing, but I've also been diagnosed with ADHD and that's a huge part of my health journey as well because I got off prescription drugs from that. I've been off for like at least four years now. And so I've been handling my ADD and ADHD symptoms like naturally through food and and through other lifestyle habits. And so when I'm not able to get work done, it's really, it's like, it feels extra hard for me because it's like, oh, well, is this just my ADHD? But I don't like to label myself as anything. Like I'm still like a good, productive, like working human. But then I just remind myself with those negative thought patterns, like, you know, be gracious, be kind to myself. Like sometimes I really just can't help it. Um, and but then the way that I do help it is by just not eating those grains because, like you said, or the uh, the gluten because it's just not worth it because it leads down this like road of I just I can't get any work done. <laughs> yeah, it's a spiral. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks for explaining. And the bloating. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, it's that's so huge. Efficient. So because huge. to get. To get, not to get too TMI, but like everyone deals with these problems on another level or whatever, but it stocks me up. Like I can't go to the bathroom for, like it throws off my regularity for my digestive system. And I know that that's what it is, the gluten. For sure. So what were the biggest culprits of the gluten like that you were eating, like uh, slices of wheat bread or like what kind of things did you remove? Yeah, at first I had no idea. Um, it, I, I think what I was, a lot of what I was eating was, like, uh, like hamburgers were one of my favorite things to eat. So like the buns, those are those have gluten in them. Um, pasta, pizza, the all the crust. Um, luckily now there's a lot of substitutes for those things if you still want to eat those types of foods. But yeah, essentially I removed all the bready stuff that was all gone. And then everything else, oh, beer was another thing. I was drinking a lot of beer and that was one of my favorite things to do. Like being social was just sip on a beer. I knew it was like, 
I can't drink beer anymore. <laughs> so I was like, okay, no more beer. But, you know, I just switched that over to like hard kombucha or like seltzers or tequila if I was or wine if I was going to have a drink. But so beer was beer was the main liquid culprit that I feel like a lot of people don't realize it's like, oh, I feel bloated. Like after drinking a beer, it could be the gluten in the beer. So. Totally. Yeah. I can, I can see that. Uh, I love the proactiveness, uh, in, in your approach of removing foods and seeing what happens. It's, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's the great way to, to, to yeah. Go. I, I feel like going off of that too, it's like, I, I like to think of it as like an experiment in a way, like you looking at yourself, like logging the data, looking at yourself, like non-judgmentally with food being like, okay, I'm just going to start to pay attention a little bit more and like kind of connect to my, my physical body and be like, like, how do I feel? Do I have a stomach ache? Do I feel nauseous? Like, what are the symptoms that my body's telling me that either like that was good or like maybe not so good? So. I like the idea of viewing yourself as an experiment um, because I feel like it's one of the best ways to be non-judgmental with yourself. Because it's like if you look at yourself as you're experimenting, you know, with like a bunch of stuff, whether mental, physical, food, any of that, you know, it, mm -hmm. it's almost like you don't have to try to take the judgment out. The judgment is just out. It's just removed. Yeah. It's, it's not in the ingredients for experimenting, you know? Um, exactly. So that's, yeah, that's a great mindset to go into it as. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause it, yeah, it's just seeing what works and what doesn't. And at different points in your life, you know, one thing might work. And then later down the line, it might not work anymore. And then you have to get back into experimentation mode being like, okay, well, what were the variables and what were the factors in my life that was making this work or not work at the time? And then what does my life look like now? And like, what is going to be the best thing for me? Like that I need, that's going to nourish me like right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agreed. What are some foods that your body doesn't agree with and what does that actualize as physically or mentally? So like do certain foods do like different things for you, I guess? Yeah, I love that question too, because it's not just the gluten and it will be a little bit different, I think for myself depending, but usually the symptoms are pretty, the physical feeling symptoms are pretty similar. Um, some are more subtle than others. So it took me a long time to figure this out. And as I was going down, you know, it's like, how can I just feel better and better and better? So after I cut out the gluten, I started with dairy after that, because I noticed my skin was kind of like just acne and like not very clear. And even the smallest bit of dairy for some people can throw their hormones like out of whack. So understanding myself knowing, okay, I'm trying to balance my hormones. So I'm just going to remove that from the picture. And I noticed I started to feel just better in general. It wasn't like cheese was bothering my stomach or anything like that. Um, like I didn't think I was lactose from eating like yogurt or anything, but I just wanted to remove it from my skin and I felt better. And then after that, I started cutting out the refined sugar, refined carbs. So I really minimized the amount of processed food I was eating. So like if I was going to have sugar, it would have to be cane sugar or from maple syrup or from agave um, or just naturally occurring in like fruits and, and some amount of vegetables has some sugar too. And I noticed that I like my energy levels just increased from doing that, from eating like real food. And I didn't notice it at first that maybe I was a little bit drained or tired, but I noticed after I removed it that my energy levels just like increased like a lot more. And I just felt more clear in my head. And then same thing, experimenting with corn. It took me a long time to, to do that because I kind of leaned on corn. I know that sounds weird, but like, <laughs> Um, like tacos, for example. So like I couldn't eat flour tortillas, but I could eat corn tortillas. 
and I love tacos. So I was eating tacos a good amount. And, but I was eating the corn tortilla and I was eating a lot of like tortilla chips. And I started to learn more about my hormones and stuff. And I was like, and, and just the way that corn is grown in America too. There's just a lot of pesticides with the corn, which is an endocrine disruptor. So I was like, I'm going to remove corn for my hormones and see what happens. And I just felt better. It wasn't that I felt horrible eating corn. It was just like, I felt better not eating corn. And then <laughs> I've like done so many experiments on myself with food. Same with grains. So brown rice, I've noticed, because that's a lot of, that's a huge substitute for gluten-free foods is like brown rice or tapioca starch or like any of that stuff. If I eat rice, it makes me tired. It makes me really sleepy and it introduces that brain fog again. And I believe it to be because it's, it's spiking my blood sugar. So I pay attention to, to my blood sugar. That's one of the main things that I, I look at now is how can I stabilize my blood sugar so my energy levels can stay pretty, pretty even rather than going up and down like this where it's making me tired or not wanting to focus and all that stuff. So I be I still eat rice and I still eat oats and like grains like that, but I just try to take it down a notch, like only eat a small amount. And then I have like certain biohacks that I do to like mitigate the amount of blood sugar spike that I might have. And then lastly, alcohol, I have to mention it because it's so prevalent in our society. It's like such a normal thing for everyone to have. Um, however, I noticed that when I did cut out alcohol, the amount of clarity that I had, like my cognitive benefits, incredible. Like I just felt so much more clear, level-headed, and it takes a time to get there. Like even one drink can almost like throw me out of this like sense of clarity that I have. But then at the same time too, it's like, okay, yes, live a little, have a good time. Don't let it bother you. But I just noticed that when I cut out alcohol for like two or three months, I just felt like that was the best time I've ever felt physically and mentally. Have you brought these learnings and knowledge to your clients? Have you been able to help them achieve any changes like you did? Yeah. So I really, with my clients, I, I'm a big believer in, you know, if, cause I don't really like people telling me like exactly what I need to do, like unsolicited advice, unless I ask for it where that it is solicited. So I like to ask my clients questions in what their goals are and what they're looking to achieve and what they've tried in the past to get there and whether it worked or didn't work. And I'll offer light suggestions if they'll allow me to in telling them like what's worked for me and kind of, again, like giving them the idea of you can try this out, like the experiment thing, see if it works for you. Um, if it doesn't, it doesn't. And if it does, then great. And if it doesn't, we'll go back to the drawing board and find out something that does work for you. But we'll try this thing for a period of time and see kind of the results that you get from it. And just like be open to kind of what comes up. And I think with changing any sort of habit or routine, there's always a sense of uncomfortability, if that's a word. <laughs> and it's getting used to that too, because it could be like at first, it might you might not like it just because it's different, but really giving it enough time to set in the change and be like, okay, you know what, actually I'm used to this now and it feels better. So I kind of experiment with them, but I never like telling people what to do because it almost creates this like defensiveness. So I like to, you know, have them bring up to me what they're working on uh, or what they'd like to achieve. And then we can take the steps to get there versus like, I don't just go, okay, all of my clients need to do this because if, if their goal isn't the same as mine, then it's not going to be, it's not like, it just, you know, it may be better for their health or like, for example, I guess, like I have a client who is really like, he loves where he's at right now, feels great, is moving his body, is eating well. But for example, if, if 
if somebody was like, I want to gain more weight and like, I want to get big, like muscle wise. And they'd be like, okay, this is what you need to do. Um, but because he's not asking me to do that, I'm not telling him like, oh, you need to eat more and you need to do this and you need to do that. So it really just depends on their goals. That was a good explanation. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Do any stories in particular stand out of um, clients that had a great transformation by changing something in their nutrition or in their fitness, I guess? Yeah, I think one of the main things with nutrition that I feel like it's almost a gateway to understanding yourself better in your own habits in terms of emotional um or like your emotions and even your spiritual self and understanding even your thought patterns that you have around food. So I did a group training program that uh, went really well and it wasn't necessarily only about the nutrition on our plate, but it was about like, how are we nourishing ourselves like off of the plate and in our life? Because a lot of times, people focus on like there's this crazy statistic in the health industry like huge industry that like 90 percent of people or 90 percent of the money that's spent in that industry is spent on weight loss interventions like diet teas or like meal replacement shakes trainers all that stuff everything to like lose weight but 90 percent of people that focus their effort and their finances on weight loss, gain their weight back plus more. So that just shows that the problem doesn't lie in the physical like weight loss. You can lose the weight and then usually people's mindset once they lose the weight is, okay, I've done it. And then they go back to like whatever they were doing before. So it's not sustainable. So what I like worked on with this group that went pretty well was that we focused on the mindset around food and our habits and our patterns around it as well. So you can create like a story in your head about why you need to eat. But if you recognize your emotions around that, around that time or while you're eating, if you like stop and you're like, I'm stressed out. Like maybe this is why I am eating because like a lot of people will just mindlessly eat. Or if you've told yourself, even growing up, like I know, like God, God bless like my mom and family, but there were still comments about my weight growing up as a kid. And so it was something that I've always been subconscious about um, or even conscious about when it comes to food, because there's a story. It's like, oh, if you're going to eat that, like you're going to get fat. And it's like, oh, no, you can't eat that. And then it turns into like restriction and all this stuff. So I find that this comes up for a lot, especially of women, like my female clients. This comes up a lot for them where it's like always just that, like this fear, they place this fear around food. And so working on like removing that so we can be more comfortable. Um, and then really kind of trying to backtrack and understand like, where is this fear even coming from? So it could be as simple as, like I said, like hearing this story when you've grown up as a kid, like, oh, if I eat this, like I'm going to get, I'm going to become overweight. So like, I can't, but then we like feed ourselves into this, like binging and restriction and, and whatever it is, however it like manifests. Um, so what my clients have said is, they love coming off of my program and feeling like they're more health conscious, like they're more aware of themselves and kind of where their habits are coming from. Because really to make any sort of lasting change, you need to have that self-awareness. So that's what I really love to work on with my clients is bringing that sense of awareness. And I believe that looking at our plate and our food and our habits around that gives us a portal to understanding ourselves better. It's really interesting to me, um, you know, because then that's something that my clients have that they can carry on throughout, like, because my goal is not to have people work with me forever. Like, I want people to be able to rely on themselves 
to know themselves, to take care of themselves and, and be able to do that on their own. But I'm like here for them to have that level of accountability and helping them understand how it's all working together. So if they tell me like, I have this new level of awareness around myself and my health, it's amazing. Yeah, that's great stuff. Uh, the word awareness keeps coming into my mind as uh, as I'm listening to to you speak and share mm -hmm. your perspective. It's you seem very aware and very open to the feedback from reality uh, whenever you try something new. It's again, that's just another way of saying experimentation. Yeah, basically. exactly. But that's so, but that's so crucial. I think a lot of people could benefit from being. Uh, more experimental when mm -hmm. it comes to their diet, to their exercise, all sorts of things. But but it has to be done without the expectation, mm -hmm. without trying to guess, oh, I think this is what's going to happen, or I hope this is what's going to happen. There's an openness that's required to seeing like, hey, all right, well, what actually did happen? I just want, I'm concerned and I'm interested in what actually is the case. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's something that uh, our viewers, listeners can really uh, gain from, from listening to, to everything you've said today so far. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. It's super crucial to have that mindset. And, and like you said, the expectation of that you're going to get a certain result out of one do one particular thing that you're doing. I mean, it's always great to to have that hope um, and want that for yourself. But yeah, just really being open to whatever happens and, and knowing that regardless, you're moving forward because you're learning more about yourself and like what works and what doesn't. Nice. Uh, any final questions, Kira? I think that I'll just talk about what I think is most important from everything that you've shared with us today, like Robert did, um, because I think that it's really important for people to start looking at their ingredients and like really understanding that like, there's a reason why you feel a certain way after you're eating whatever you're eating. And you know, um, I think it's really interesting your fact about, um, it's not the physical that's the issue. It's something more than that. And um, because you said that everyone who's like buying like the weight loss stuff and like trying to shed the weight and everything, they do, but then they gain back that plus more. And I've seen that happen to so many people. Um, so it's just so interesting to really begin to educate yourself about what's going in your body, how you feel, and I think that this is a great podcast for somebody to listen to um, if, you know, that's what they want to do in their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all about going deeper and like getting to the root of the problem because it all shows up physically. Yeah, exactly. And then but you need to look deeper inside if you want to have that lasting change and really create that that love for yourself. I think that that's a lot of what it boils down to as, as well. And it's, it is way easier said than done. Um, but yeah, bringing curiosity and, and an, and a willingness to learn about yourself is, is the key. It's fun too. Yeah. It's, it's so fun. <laughs> it's a fun process. Um, yeah. I remember I did like the, Arbon cleanse years ago and um, I didn't drink for 30 days and then I think I did it like twice in a row um, like I did like two cleanses because I just loved how I felt so mm -hmm. I didn't drink again for a month and you know I didn't eat the corn and things like that which reminds me I thought that your corn thing was interesting because mm -hmm. like I feel like corn shells they're so much better right than the flowers but then I feel like maybe I eat them and I don't know, something has been like stirring, like in the back of my mind lately. It's like, I'm not sure if I agree with this, this, this yeah. corn shell. I don't know. So that's, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. 
but it, yeah and that's a great example too if you have a thought like that coming up like we were like maybe this isn't working for me lean into that and get curious about it and be like maybe i should try to to get rid of corn because i've had people t say to me like asking me about the gluten thing because they're like curious they're like i i don't know if it's working for me actually because my stomach hurts and i get tired every time i eat pasta and i'm like it could be the gluten and they're like i yeah i've been curious about trying it so if you have those thoughts it, it's they're coming up for a reason right like you want to look into that and 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 see kind of that's where you can go toward experimenting be like okay this is something that i can work with agreed yeah. agreed and yeah it's it's fun i mean i'm excited you know i was talking to you about going on a cleanse and Flushing this out, it's a great, it's a great motivator and inspirer to get me going. Good, yeah, yeah, that's good. Me too, I'm right. like, what, what can I do now? Like, I need to. <laughs> Juice yeah. cleanse, wheatgrass. Yeah, those are fun. I like wheatgrass. I'd love to reintroduce wheatgrass. It's been a while for me. Oh, uh, did that make you bloat? It was so long ago. I, I would just randomly go to Jamba Juice and be like, I'll take a wheatgrass shot. But it was like years ago. Like I I wouldn't even be able to tell you if, like how I felt afterwards. Okay. That's interesting. But yeah, I don't try. know. It's, just, it's like I've taken some shots before. I know that it's really hydrating. Mm -hmm. um, but then I also feel like something inside of it, it's almost like it – bloats me but then like the bloat goes right down it's almost like it was like a beneficial bloat of the wheatgrass mm -hmm. so that's interesting too um mm -hmm. what about you robert take shots of wheatgrass <laughs> i don't but i do think that i bloat when i consume gluten so um going to look at that and see how i can make adjustments so like Kira said, very, very inspiring lessons today, Emily. So good. Yeah. I'm uh, glad. And let me know how it goes. Yeah. Oh yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll be in touch for sure. And, and as a segue, if people want to learn more about your, your, uh, your information, your practice, what, uh, how can they find out more? Right. So I feel like Instagram's kind of like my main hub at the moment. So you can find me on Instagram at Emily Nader fit. And that's N-A-D-E-R. Um, on there, you can find my link tree. It links up to my site. And I have a guide on there that will help you kind of understand. Like, it's a good starter point in getting to know yourself and, and your diet and, like, what foods to eat. So um, that link is on there, too. So you can just find me on Instagram, and it's all there in my bio. Yay. Thanks so much for coming on, Emily. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. And we'll see you all in the next episode.